that data has to be reliable, the data has to be extensible and preferably in a form that can be manipulated in their country. So I think you'll see today how we have succeeded collectively in putting together one of these programs, collecting huge amounts of information. That information is available to people, it's web based, it's on a single uh, common platform. And I think it has tremendous applicability when we look into developing metrics for other programs and justify our work to solid data. So congratulations again for putting it on, and I look forward to listening to uh, Jim's presentation. Thanks so much.
data, which is the, the national discharger data for discharges of POPWs. Um, what's neat about this also is this same node has other capabilities. Uh, you'll see the bottom line there that talks about TRI data moving from CDX to the Cali PA node. Well, toxic release uh, in, uh, information is information about uh, permitted releases all over the state. And that information actually is reported by businesses to the US EPA, not to the state. Uh, and then it actually flows down from US EPA into the state node, and that is now available to the node for a variety of uh, purposes. It's currently used by DTNC and some of their tools, but can be used almost anywhere else. Um, this node also takes input. You'll see over on the far left side of the screen, uh, the California Department of uh, Toxic Substance Control has record info flowing into it. That's actually information coming out of their EnviroStore data system, um, which is housed off-site. It's uh, a hosted site, and that information is fed into EnviroStore by ETSC staff during their inspections. Uh, it's fed through other parts of ETSC, such as the ID number, system registration system, which plugs information in, into EnviroStore. And then information that is it flows actually out of the virus bar into the node and then is reported on PTA. Uh, so it's similar with the ISO 50 system uh, that's currently under development by the uh, water board. That, that flow, uh, once completed, will, will allow data to go from their CWIX system, so a business uh, re a regulated entity reports into CWIX and then it flows from CWIX into our node. And then from our node, it actually flows up to the uh, US EPA, uh, CDX. And then from there, it actually is routed off to the W2X system, um, or part of the entity uh, system. Water quality is right now is actually coming out of the CDX um, system, um, which is the water, another water board system that collects information from all of the state. Um, the water quality information on the state flows into our node and then actually makes that W2X connection through CDX into the W2X national. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, you'll see it says uh, Unified Program, Cooper's Facilities. That's actually a Cooper's Facilities piece is the SERS system. Uh, so SERS actually links into the node via the exchange system and provides data into the node. And then that data is actually moved to a variety of places. In the far upper part of the slide, you can actually see Dallas symbol up there and it says tier two. Well tier two data is US EPA's chemical inventory data and that is the published tier two data and I'll come back to that in a later slide. I just want you to realize that what's happening here is data from the Coupas is flowing in from local systems into our node and then our node peels off the tier two data and, and makes it available to UT Dallas and UT Dallas actually comes in and consumes that information on their schedule, uh, which means that there's no pipeline there, which is an important concept. So what we have is we have, we're using national standards to move data around, we're using California standards uh, between the CUPAs and the node, those standards are published, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and then we're using information out of, out of RIC, uh, RIC information out of the virus source system, and also the Coupas, uh, um, the Coupas do March 20 January inspections, and that actually is RICRA, and it gets routed off to the RICRA system as well. So that node is actually doing a lot of work, and this is just the very beginning of what we're going to be doing with this. So information movement first um, is it, the system for information movement. I want to kind of just do a visual here real fast to get a sense of what we're doing. What's important about this slide is we have this thing called an XML document kind of in the middle of the screen which sits between the states and the COPAs. An XML document is actually the standard. It is the state standard. It's built up of about seven different published standards. They're actually sitting on our website. I'll show you that slide in a while. Uh, but that, those standards are published and they're public, which means anybody can use them. So, what we have right now is we have SERS 2 up and running. We have businesses reporting into SERS 2 itself. And then we're also going to have businesses reporting into local data systems. Uh, and those local data systems then will be working through the same XML documents, which are the standards that move information to the, the that thing called Open Note 2 with REST interface. 
Uh, REST is a technology, and Open Node 2 is the Cal EPA exchange node. Uh, I want to point out right now, Decade is building the REST connector on the Coupa side of the house, um, which actually will allow businesses, inf business information that goes to the local system to actually be moved up to the Coupa system, up, pardon me, up to SIRS. So this whole system is built on standards, and that's the point of the slide, is to show you that we have this set of standards that everybody is using. We're using national standards, and we're also using state standards. So in a nutshell, that's actually exchange. Um, but I want to talk now about SERS itself, more so as it applies to this movement of data, both the collection and movement of data. SERS is actually live. Uh, it is up and running. Uh, this is the actual front page of SERS. It's called SERS Central. Um, yes, you mean, right? SERS Central. Um, it's, um, it, it is a business portal and a regular portal. Both of them are on the same front page. If you're a business and you sign in the business portal, you will choose that, that path, and once you're in there, you're in your own world. You're not in the regulator world any longer. Similarly, the regulators, let's say, actually go to the regulator portal and sign in. They're actually in that portal now, and so they don't see the business side of the house, they'll see the regulator side of the house. What's important about this is this is a centralized page that gives you a lot of different information. We have on the, um, under the regulator side of the house, we have a violation library fact sheet, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We have a training portal, both on businesses and regulator side. The training portal is a fully functional copy of the site that's in training, so you can go in there and, and just play around. It's a sandbox. You can do whatever you want to, and it, and it won't hurt the actual data system. Um, we have a registry, which is where all of our standards are published, and, and then we have links to uh, things like the, the different uh, user groups are on this page as well. So let me just give you a sense of size. Uh, most of you probably are aware of this already, but for those of you not, I'm just going to give you a real fast overview here. Uh, we regulate 115 local agencies throughout the state that cover the entire state of California. There are um, 60,000 inspections a year. That's an interesting number there. That's the, the small number, 60,000. And that, that's combined inspections. If you actually talk about actual individual inspections, there's 80 to 90,000 inspections a year happening in California done by local government agencies. There's 144,000 regulated businesses, and you can see the size of the regulated community. The point of the slide is, it's a large program. And it, it covers a large number of uh, regulated entities, and this both businesses and local government agencies. This is the information we're currently collecting um, in search. Uh, we collect uh, this in a variety of different ways and off of uh, pages that were modeled after the Unified Program Consolidated Form, UPCF, which will stop being the collection mechanism. Uh, this January uh, in 2013, and only electronic methods will be used to do that. So we have facility owner operating information, hazardous waste information, underground tank, above ground tank, hazardous waste, and most importantly, we also now have inspection and enforcement data. Uh, in the federal world, that's called CME, Compliance Monitoring and Enforcement Data, uh, and that's information we've all been looking for for some time. So, how many businesses are recovering right now? Well, about 144,000 businesses uh, actually are, are going to be have their information moved around and they're reporting into SERS in a, a couple different ways. Uh, on the um, left side there, the uh, pie chart shows you that 90% of the business information that is actually collected will be moved electronically. It will not be uploaded and downloaded. It's actually going to be exchanged. Um, that, so that's a machine-to-machine -machine movement. Once they, they, they business has submitted their information either through CERN or through a local portal, that information, almost 90% is being moved electronically. So no human being has to touch that data to actually get it between the state and local government or local government and state. So on the other uh, pie chart, we have business information. This is how businesses actually report. And as of today, um, or last week, uh, about two-thirds of the Businesses in California will be using SERS as a local portal, as their local portal. Um, pardon me, I should say that. 
two thirds of the businesses uh, in the state are going to be using CERT as their entry portal. Um, about a third of the businesses in the state will see a local portal as their entry portal. So what that means is that CERT is going to have 100,000 businesses working with it, and the uh, rest of the portals are going to have around 50,000 businesses working with it in, in rough numbers. That's the, the sort of the, the way it's going to be looking at this point. I want to point out a couple of statistics that we just pulled off the system uh, in the last couple of days. Um, and as an example, uh, in the third system uh, in late uh, 2011, we had, in rough numbers, we had about uh, 14,000 user identities within SERS. Well, in the last six months since we put SERS 2 up, we've had 2,000 new ones come in. That's important. They're coming into SERS 2. Um, we expect that number of 2,000 to, to grow pretty dramatically in the next six months as we go into the end of the year. Um, so if you can see, we're, right now we're probably sitting at about 18,000 users in SERS, and we expect to have somewhere between 90 and 100,000 by the end of the year. So there's going to be a tremendous growth in the number of businesses checking into SERS here in the next six months. Um, we've had, on the successful finance, those are businesses that are signing into um, SERS. Uh, there's a lot of activity there. Uh, I should say, uh, this is on the business portal side. Um, we had 22,000 uh, logins uh, in the last six months. So the businesses that are actually logging in are logging in a lot. Uh, and they're, so they're putting a lot of data in. They're actually building a lot of information systems currently inside of servers. We, we know a lot of larger businesses, such as the multi jurisdictional businesses, are spending a significant amount of time putting data in search right now, so they're ready to go in 2013. Um, formal submittals. Uh, in the last six months, we've had um, 4,500 formal submittals through SERS, which is into those um, coupons that are currently allowing businesses to support the SERS as their submittal tool. And there's a fair number of uh, coupons out there that are actually doing that uh, right now. So you, we've got um, 4,500 actual formal submittals since the beginning of the year. Even though they didn't have to, they could have done paper. That, that's telling us that people are starting to pick up businesses and are actually starting to use it. The, the last thing I want to point out is, is all this data has to have some checks and balances on it. And CERT has got a huge number of actual data checks for uh, business going into CERT to put information in. Well, one of the things we always ask about is what is the, what is the quality assurance process in SERS or any data system? Well, right now, just to see an idea, we have 989 data validity checks that businesses use when they go into SERS. 989 of them. Um, that's almost a thousand validity checks as a, as a business is using SERS. That's spread out through all of SERS. Not one, one business doesn't get all thousand checks at one time. But it, it, Everything is checked. I mean, things are checked for stock, uh, you know, the type of data against the right kind of data. It's checked against, you know, how they connected other parts of SERS. Can they continue to move forward? And SERS gives a lot of warnings for those people who are not putting it in properly. Let me jump into SERS. Show you, if you haven't been into SERS and you haven't looked at it, kind of what it looks like at this point. This is the actual SERS. Um, System itself is built uh, on a turbo, turbo tax model. Um, it, a business comes in, uh, they report into SERS, create an identity, and then after they create a facility, they look at uh, what they're actually doing and report into SERS what they're actually regulated under. And then that drives the rest of the, the interaction that that business has with SERS. So right now we have. Um, Underground tank information collection systems has mass collection systems, ASD collection systems, and hazardous waste on-site treatment collection systems. Um, and you can, every business can report anything they want in the search at this point. What, what's neat about this is this is essentially the beginning of the online permit application process because this is where a business is actually collecting, putting information in for the regulator to actually review before issuing a permit. So we tend to look at this as an information collection at the beginning of, the, of an online permitting system. Just as an example of that, we have underground tanks. Uh, certainly everybody knows about underground tank permits. Well, this is just a slide 
showing that this is the actual underground tank permit slide for a business that actually has uh, underground tanks. But also, this particular slide shows that they have hazardous material inventories because there's a bar that shows that that's an activated uh, part of the system as well. What you can see under the underground storage tanks is all of these that they have to have. It's, a, it's the basic data permit application, tank information, monitoring plan, and then all the lists underneath that, all of the different components that are required to be reported before the business actually can successfully submit in the formal sense uh, their, uh, their underground tank information. Going on, um, CERF actually has a chemical library in it. It's a standardized chemical library. Uh, we are have uh, in, in roughly about 15 to 16,000 chemicals currently in the uh, system with detailed data on them. We have 25,000 chemicals in it that are named. So we have information downloaded from US EPA's chemical information system. And that information is now resident in the chemical library. Once a business actually logs into CERS and is, is starting a hazmat report uh, of chemical inventories, they will start typing the information in, as you see there on the screen, that, that once they type it in, CERS actually finds the chemical and it populates the information that's actually in CERS. We have a discussion going on right now with the University of Washington, uh, which has a chemical library with, with the information in it. And they actually have 75,000 chemicals with response information. So we are negotiating with them right now. They've agreed to download that database to us. We're in the process right now of coming up with the uh, interagency agreement that's going to allow us to do that on an annual basis. So we'll, we'll be updating on an annual basis and downloading the chemical library from the state of Washington because they have a very robust program there at the university to actually manage this information. Um, once the information is in, um, this is uh, the, the next screen that would be automatically populated. Um, you can manually information, enter information here if, in fact, it's not in the library, or if you want to override the library. Um, the system actually does capture the information if you're a business and you say, I'm going to override the library. It tells us that and it captures it permanently that you've overridden the library for, for whatever reason. Um, the, the library populates the information, and, and then we can actually continue from there. The reason I'm showing this is because I, I want to make sure everybody understands this is a standardized chemical library that we're actually putting in inside of service, and that is really important when we start looking at chemical inventories around the state and are we calling everything the same thing? Uh, are we actually you know, comparing apples to apples when we start looking at chemical inventories? Well, we're doing the same thing with the violation library. Uh, the Violation Library is a library that uh, Coopers and the state worked together on for about 18 months, or less than, uh, uh, but close to 18 months all, all together, that standardized violations within the Unified Program. Currently, we've, we've come up with a standardized list. This is the library itself. It's, it's on our website. It's public. And, and you can see there that every uh, violation has a name. Um, it has a program it belongs to, it's a description, and then the, um, the violation type number is actually the internal numbering scheme that is used by the library itself, just a catalog of things. It's not a formal numbering system that's used anywhere, it's just an internal system. And, and this is just the view, it's a snapshot view that the user gets. You can display a lot more of this, you can download the entire library as well. The library has 550 over 550 individual violation listings across the, the waste management programs, the USD, AST, CalArt programs, and also the business plan and chemical inventory program. The violation library actually has the actual specific citation for the violation, and it's both the state violation and the federal violation, if there are federal, federal violations, which is really important because that gives people the, the knowledge of where this violation actually came from. Uh, inside of the violation library, the, the working group categorized the violations into a variety of different categories so that we can run reports by category. So what we have is we have administrative categories, 
We have illegal disposal of damages, categories, design, construction, push for tanks, for tank violations, installation, and operation maintenance, release, and training. Um, and those are just the general categories. What we've done is we've created this, this standard violation library. It is inside of SERS. It, it is not a compulsion on all of the CUPAs to use. However, if there is a compulsion, to map to it. So to exchange data with SERS, you have to map the local violation system to the state violation library. But at the state level, we can actually run the reports that are meaningful. So we can run a report on a particular violation, or we can run a report on a variety of violations, for instance, a scatter chart on all violations, and how many happen to be defined. And instead of just looking at administrative violations, we can look at things like illegal disposal violations, or operation maintenance kinds of violations, which are far higher risk than administrative violations. This gives us the, the ability to sort of move forward and to address those, those risk-based kinds of planning that we've been wanting to do for years and we're having difficulties finding information on defining risks. So the chemical and violation libraries are available. Uh, they're available on our service website. Uh, they're available for anybody to download. They are completely public. And they're, they're up to date by the minute. Uh, the actual libraries that are on site are, are actively automatically updated. So if there's any change anywhere, it actually goes right to the library. So when you download it, you get the most current version. I want to jump to data publishing now. Um, data publishing is exciting uh, for lots of reasons. Data publishing deals with information sharing is what it does. Um, in, in the concept of data publishing, what two things. We can create pipelines between systems. Uh, pipelines are, you know, like, like connections. So just like the, the term of pipeline connotates, there is a uh, this ongoing permanent connection between data systems. Or we can build sources that can be consumed. Uh, and building sources is data publishing. Building sources means I figure out a way to put the information out and when people want it, they come and get it. So I get to create a dedicated pipeline for that information, which means that I'm, I'm using my resources to the maximum and only the people who want the information come and get it. And I don't have to maintain a pipeline forever. So I'm going to go back to this um, slide that I started with at the beginning that shows our node at, in the middle. And remember, I pointed out that you uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, on the top slide there. Well, that particular link between our node and UT Dallas, Texas is one way into UT Dallas, Texas, as you can see by the arrow. Well, what's happening there is UT Dallas, Texas, Texas subscribes to our node as a consumer. And they have the appropriate credentials to actually come into our node and get information that's defined within their credentials for them to consume. And that's tier two data, and that's the federal hazardous materials inventory information. So we have created this, this, this tool on our node, which is a publishing tool. And we have published tier two data, which is actually extracted out of the SERS system from the coupons. So the coupons, uh, and the business, and part of the business. Businesses report the information through the Kubernetes or through the state. It goes into our data system, SERS, and then SERS actually provides that information to the node, and the node extracts only the tier two data, and puts it in a space that's available for UT Dallas, Texas to come and get. They come in when they need to, they, they find in with their credentials. Uh, they can either do it manually or machine to machine. In this particular case, they actually find in machine to machine on an automated basis. And right now, they're picking up the tier two data once a month. And their their machine just literally walks into ours, says, "Hi, I'm here. Give me all the tier two data, the new stuff." And our our system ships all the data to them that's new for them. And then they say thanks, and they're off. They're on. So they're not connected to our system constantly. They're only there to consume the data. It, it, what's really neat about this concept is, in this particular case, UT Dallas, Texas, also utilizes that data for two other uses. One of them is, is they populate a response tool called ePlan, and I'll talk about that in a second. 
Uh, the other thing they do is they actually take that Tier 2 data and provide it to Homeland Security. Um, federal Homeland Security has been after California data for a long time because we don't routinely report all of our data up through the, the standard kind of systems like Rick and Co and those kinds of things in California because we're so large um, that it doesn't really work for us. Rick and Co is mostly manually input by the rest of the country that you, that are smaller states that use it. Um, in our case, we're far too large to do that. So that's why we have an exchange system that provides that information. And, it, and now UTL of Texas is consuming off of our node um, and, and providing information to other places. Um, it is the first of the projects that are publishing kinds of projects. We can publish any data we want um, as long as we put the appropriate credentials around it and we make it available. I'm going to talk about something exciting about publishing in a little bit, but let me talk about ePlan for just a minute. Uh, ePlan was created by the University of Texas Dallas. It is supported by them. It was created with federal money, and it is it continues to be supported by USDP and Homeland Security. It's a response tool. Um, it's an emergency response information system. That's what it's all about. What it provides is it provides hazardous material emergency response information for responders that are field level responders. It can also uh, provide disaster response and recovery information for search and rescue, reconnaissance, and impact assessment. Um, and those, those are the, that's the information that's extracted from facility data that's actually inside of ePlan. And, and remember, that information came from a business that reported into third or to a local portal that got moved into the Cal EPA node, and then that node uh, published it to uh, to be consumed uh, and Dell came over, got it, and then grabbed it and put it into G Plan. And now it's available. And it's not just available to Dallas, Texas, or to Homeland Security. It's available to anybody with credentials to go to G Plan. And the state manages access to G Plan as well so that we can provide access to those people who need that kind of information. We also, G Plan has a compliance assurance system in it. And also, they use them for preparedness and contingency planning. So it's a very powerful kind of information movement. Just some, some key features, just so you know, responders get they can download the file into Excel uh, or PDF or any kind of tier two zip files. Uh, they get maps of the surrounding areas if, in fact, they're shown. And to back up just a little bit, the uh, system we have in place right now that exchanges information between businesses in Coupas and Coupas in the state, state, US EPA, allows the attachment of um, documents which are maps. And so those maps can be attached, they're required to be attached actually to the third system and to be exchanged in, in from local government. Uh, from there, the maps could be made available to a key plan. Right now, we have not made them available because we're still working around uh, on how what kind of format we want to make them available to because we can get them in a variety of formats. And we also want to make sure that they're not going out to just anybody, obviously. Um, so uh, some other things we can get out of this is maps of the surrounding area. ePlan is tied into all kinds of mapping systems. Um, and that is uh, any kind of mapping ability off of the facility files. And so you can make it do search for hazmat facilities for containing chemicals and array quantities. We get automatic web services for government agencies to query key plans. So there's a lot of stuff going on there, and that's just off of one project, which was the publishing project. This is something that is very new. It's also very exciting. Um, it, it is almost like a cartoon drawing. It, it, it is, this is an actual picture right off of website. This is real. It's live today. Uh, and anybody on this conference call can actually download this tool. It's called the Exchange Network Browser. And if you go to the Exchange Network, which was in one of my first slides, uh, that, that, that first slide I showed you on the Exchange Network, you can download this browser. And this browser allows you to do some really neat things with gathering information from all, a variety of different sources. Each one of these boxes you see on the screen, like indoor air quality, air quality, response resources, drinking water, wastewater, every one of those kind of like boxes actually is a link to a set of data behind it. Now the link behind it is the data that is coming out of nodes. What this network exchange browser does is it browses exchange nodes. So it will browse the California 
an account EP exchange node, and from that exchange node, it can see whatever we allow it to see. Um, we are in the process right now of making decisions on what we will in fact allow it to see. Uh, and so what happens is, if you go into an example, into the drinking water tab, I'll do this in a slide for it, this is what you get. What you're seeing there is, it doesn't look nice and splashy, but what it, what's really important about it is, each one of those node services is actually a live node. I actually made this slide last week. Um, so it, it is, in fact, yeah, I made it on the 2nd of August, this one I actually made it. Um, the, it was updated just before noon on the 2nd of August. Those are all updates of when each of those nodes were updated because they update on an automatic and continuous basis. So what you're looking at is, is things like water quality that is, is actually um, available to you in, in nodes. Now our node's not on there yet because we haven't allowed it to be on there yet because we're still defining what we want to show. But what's on there right now is the US EPA CDX system for water quality. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, if you can see that uh, there's an awful lot of information going to be available. This is just one particular thing. Uh, one thing to note, there are dozens of node services available on the node right now all over the country. So that's an exciting technology. This is a piece of that same node technology. Uh, there's the node browser. Um, it, it's actually a tool. It's available, it's available on it. Let me jump back a uh, slide, or two slides actually. Up to the um, upper right hand corner, um, you can see a uh, title that says data analysis. Well, data analysis is a way to look at data in a variety of different ways. This is a tool inside of data analysis. Um, what's neat about this tool is it's a graphical tool. And what I want you to point out to, I want to point out at the upper left part of the slide, things you can do. You can facility search any facility that's on the node that you're actually looking at. And once you facility search it, it actually will display it with button points similar to the thing map, and it uses thing map as an underline. Um, you can look at monitoring locations for wells. You can look at sample locations for, for sampling systems for water quality or for you know, well sampling. You can look at incident searches. Um, that are in there, uh, and then you can look at response resource searches as well. Those are tools. In the uh, lower left, you see the kinds of things you can actually layer on the graph. You can see the facility layer, a monitoring layer, a sample layer. So you can actually pop in what you actually want to see, and you can check one or multiple parts of that. Uh, and then on the right hand side, you can see this is base layer control. Well, you can put base layers in here. This is coming off the US. Um, topologic map. And you can see right now that what you're looking at is you can see the topology overlay through colors and, and through basically uh, shading and, and you know the mountains and everything else. You can see all there. And you can also see waterways um, from the National Hydro Hydrography System. Uh, and you see roadways as well. You can also map, you can see population densities as well. So what you can do is you can buy making the layers more or less opaque, you can actually impose those layers over things you're looking at. This becomes a really powerful analytical tool. What I love about this analytical tool is we didn't make it, we don't support it, and we don't have to put money into it, and it's free to everybody. Anybody can get this tool any time they want. So we're moving in this direction right now to take full use of this by looking at what we're going to publish to our node so that people can actually use these kinds of things. As an example, we I met with the Seton manager, the Seton system manager, recently, and, and he wants to uh, allow most of the Seton data to come to the node so that we can then decide what's going to be available through that Seton data source at the node level for consumption as a, as a published piece of information. Well, real quickly now, let me walk through just a couple of projects that are an exciting direction that we're going. Um, I, this is just a, a wire diagram you can see there. That we have SIRS on the far right, and we have the node in the middle. Uh, SIRS feeds into the node as currently do uh, the water board and DTFC systems using, you can see that with the, the um, solid arrows. The dashed arrows are, are systems we're looking at putting into the node. 
Uh, you can see we're looking at GeoTracker piece, the, the you know, pesticide piece, and AQF. AQF uh, is a, an interesting requirement um, when air quality systems under the AQS, when air quality information under AQS is required to be reported, it's now required to be reported using the National Exchange Network. Uh, that's an EPA requirement. So we'll be pushing this information more and more to the exchange node. What's neat about that is we can just peel that information off and we can feed it in a warehouse. The data warehouse just gives us the ability to look at information. This is Hawaii's data warehouse. California has looked at um, this particular warehouse and are looking at seriously implementing this in the next two, two years, 18 months to two years. Um, that, you can see this is just a display. It's, it's a dashboard style display that lets the user get some very quick visual information. What's neat about it also is, is this, this is Hawaii, obviously, but the, the, it, the environmental data warehouse allows us to display environmental information through a variety of, of, of ways. This is, again, a mapping tool, but it also uses M3 kinds of systems, which is actual uh, GIS, is graphic information systems, layering, not just mapping. It gives you a lot more detail in the layering. When we, when we get there, you can't use it. Right now, mapping is an easier tool for us to use because it, it takes less overhead to support it. And, and so we're moving in that direction as well. But, but this tool actually comes with both the mapping and the GIS capabilities. And you can see this is a typical check the box and display what you want to check. It has search tools inside and a lot of other tools. So the, the last project I want to uh, talk about really briefly is a project that literally uh, got kicked off last week. How new it is! It, it's a project called, we, called "Is My Water Safe to Drink?" It's actually not a uh, Cal EPA project. It's actually a department of, uh, pardon me, it's a Department of Water Resources project. Um, the Department of Water Resources met with me last week on this, met with the Department of Public Health, and we're looking at creating a, a multi-year project which shares information uh, between the three agencies: the Water Resources. Um, as the public health and environmental protection. And the way we're planning on sharing it is to actually use the exchange nodes to move that data. So again, this goes back to that whole concept of exchanging data using technologies that we have in place that we're, and that are, are not expensive. The nice thing about the exchange nodes, so everybody understands this, is that they're free. Uh, we're using something called Open Node 2, which is actually developed under contract to US EPA. Um, by a company and, and it's now available free to anybody who wants to use it. So we actually downloaded that exchange note from USDP and didn't pay for it. We paid to put it up because we paid a contractor to do it. But that, the cost of that was not expensive and that actual node was actually put up in about three days from beginning to end um, by a contractor. And it's not, it's not, you know, seriously complex technology to actually, um, bringing a node into existence. What's complex is moving the information from node to node, but there's lots of uh, uh, companies that now know how to do that. So this is where we're actually headed, and, and this is, like I said, this is a multi-year project that we're actually looking at. We just started discussions on it, and it's exciting to me because it's using uh, that the technology that I started off by talking about, the exchange technologies. Um, the neat, other thing neat thing about this is US EPA is making grants available to actually do this work. So the three agencies you see on the screen there are talking about putting a grant in this next year to actually have that information uh, or to stand those notes up in all three agencies and to start making this information available. Um, is my water safe to drink collects information from uh, too many different sources to actually count uh, to count off, but it, it's an exciting project that we're all really kind of looking forward to. So with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, time for being here today. Uh, I think we're at the beginning of not only collecting data, uh, as, as Jeff had said at the beginning, but, but also as Jeff had said, beginning to figure out how to use this statistic, which is really important. So thank you very much for your attendance, and let me now turn it back over to Leslie. And then I will turn it right over to the general saw and thank you from the state software who will moderate the question and answer portions of our presentation.
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, just to be sensitive to everyone's schedule, we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted. Um, we've got about probably seven minutes for questions. So um, what you'll do is you'll go ahead and click the raise hand icon on the participants panel, which is on the right hand of your screen. And um, we'll just take those questions as they come in. Okay, we've got a question from Leslie Mix. Go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, thanks, Jim. This is a question for Jim. Um, will you think the Exchange Network browser will be available as an app uh, sometime in the future? Uh, uh, yes, I do. Um, right now, it's um, downloadable to uh, a Microsoft platform. Uh, and it also um, will run on a couple other um, operating systems. It, it doesn't run on... Uh, the Android system at this point, but they are working on it. Um, so, so US EPA recognizes that, that the Android system and anything that deals with Android and also with Apple um, are definitely in their future. And so they're working right now to make an app out of it. I don't know what it's going to come out and they didn't say. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Hey, Jim, this is Daryl with Tech Aid Software in Fresno. Thank you for your excellent presentation today. Can you give us some feedback on where GeoTracker fits into the, uh, the whole data exchange uh, metaphor for the state of California? Uh, we can be using it again. Um, uh, GeoTracker, uh, as you all know, um, is the uh, USD cleanup uh, system. And, um, Right now, there's no, there's no connection between GeoTracker and uh, SERS or, or any other systems that I'm aware of. Uh, and so it covers life by itself. Uh, there is a statute that, that was passed um, last year that requires uh, the Water Board and the Pelly to work together to move information um, from uh, Koopa to GeoTracker in a meaningful way. So the, our, our thought about how to do it uh, is going to be kind of moving it through uh, the node process. You think the exchange pieces is actually hook uh, geotracker. We haven't done any of the um, technical work in the background uh, to actually figure out how to do that. The geotracker resides in an environment that's very similar to a store, as an example. Um, the, they both are running on Oracle systems. Uh, they're, they're actually both being hosted by the same company. Uh, and so we're working with that company right now on the EnviroStore side of the house, and we've, we've worked that system out so we can move EnviroStore data into our node and work it and pass on to EPA. So there's no doubt in my mind that we'll be able to utilize the technology to move information from SERS into um, Tracker or computer tracker in the search or, or into or it's a common tool like the data warehouse. We, we haven't actually figured out yet you know, what we really need to do with it. Um, the, the most obvious is, um, the most obvious nexus is things like location data frequencies um, so that we can basically cooperate the, the USC location information in GeoTracker with USC information in search. Um, but, but we haven't started that process yet. So um, I, it's just sort of, you know, we don't expect to actually start doing that road probably for at least six months um, just because we're we our hands full with implementing the, the electronic operating side of the side of our uh, operation inside of Kelly PMA. I mean, also, I'm um, Jim and Gray is operating in the water board. They were fully engaged with things like changing the regulations right now to make sure electronic reporting works through their with their regulations as well. So we haven't given it a lot of a lot of attention at this point, but there is a, a general go forward concept. Uh, thanks, Jim. One more quick question because I see we're almost out of time, and since no one else is uh, posing a question at the moment. Uh, it, it, you know, most of the jurisdictions on this line, uh, Coupas in California, are engaged in preparing for seeding SIRS. And as we know, UST data is an optional component of that. And then chatting with Dan Firth uh, a couple weeks ago, he shared with me 
an expectation that tank data would be added to SERS in the first year, even if there wasn't a reporting requirement on the part of the businesses? Could you speak to that? Is that an expectation of the businesses or the COOPAs? We're very interested in that. Um, I guess our expectation is tank data will be added in, in, in 2013, in, in the year 2013, um, but for lots of reasons. One is we need it. Um, uh, but also because there's a, an inspection requirement, annual inspection requirement, and some of the, uh, some, I should say, a fair number of the tank, um, um, the current tank data doesn't include all the information. So to meet the requirement to report all the information for tanks, uh, the businesses either have to provide that information or it's got to be gleaned from another source. Um, the other source that is an example, the BOE number for um, government-owned tanks actually can come from another source. It actually comes from BOE itself. Um, so that, that's just like a piece of information that can be put in there. But our, our position on it at the county K level is that because a business is reporting into a new system, that information's got to be put in. Otherwise, how is the inspection going to happen in the field if everybody's using electronic methodologies? Perfect. Thank you so much, Jim. We're going to go ahead and wrap up the question and answer session, and I'm going to hand it over to Leslie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Jim for the timely information on data exchange and thanks to Justin for his message, message and guidance as we continue to migrate beyond simple data gathering to exchanging data and interpreting broad data sets. Um, to receive continued education units, you must fill out um, the survey found at um, ccdh.com. Um, the link can be found uh, on the data summit page, which um, the link can be found right on the home page. Website. Um, to receive our UTS Kitchen Education, you can even pay a $10 fee, and uh, you can pay online, or there's a form you can fill out and send in a $10 check. And if you have any questions about that, you can contact Cheryl Baldwin at Cheryl at CPDH.com. And whether or not you're, kids, you're seeking continuing education units, your feedback is valuable. Um, your feedback will allow us to improve the data summit uh, in the future and provide you with educational and timely information via webinars. So we would like to hear your thoughts on this uh, presentation today and the, the whole series in general of the data summit. So um, thank you. Thank you for joining us today and thanks to everyone.